So I'll get us started by saying welcome. And I hope that you had a chance to make your Jewel on the Nile cocktail as we were chatting about just a few minutes ago. Um, I don't have mine with me, but I hope that you're enjoying something and I'll be enjoying it vicariously with you. Uh, some of the treats that I remember enjoying while I was in Egypt, uh, I took some of those pictures here and I don't know about you, but they're making me hungry. They look really good. Um, during this program, we just like to ask that you please um, uh, note the unmute and mute buttons down here at the bottom. So uh, this will allow that we don't have any background noise. So if you'd like to keep yourself muted until the end, we're going to have another opportunity for us to open up our mics and our cameras so that we can ask questions. Also, you'll notice that as we go along, if you find you have questions, we encourage you please to write them into the chat box. So you'll notice that big red arrow there showing you. And all you have to do is wiggle your mouse on the screen, or if you're using an iPad, wiggle your finger, and those tools will come up available for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, the last but not least is that you can make the picture on either side larger or smaller by simply grabbing that one line there and dragging it one way or the other. And that way you'll have a large screen and have the great pictures. So to really get us started, I'd like to introduce our host for today. Uh, super thrilled to welcome Todd Ney, who is the product manager of Africa and Egypt for Ama Waterways. Todd has just a wealth of information and it is so much fun to hear the passion for this destination that we both share, having been to Egypt several times myself as well. My name is Kay Afray. if I haven't met you before. Uh, I'm fortunate to work here with Expedia Cruises North Bay and thrilled to be your moderator tonight. So uh, with that, I know that we are heading straight to Cairo and Todd, I'm going to ask you to take over and take us straight away to Egypt. Great, can you see the screen? Am I okay? Uh, not yet, and it's coming. And there we are, it's perfect. Take it Thank away. Goodness. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Todd, I'm talking to you from um, Los Angeles. It's, um, try to get through this for you before dinner time. And um, well, let's talk about Egypt. First of all, kind of, I like to point out location of Egypt up in the Northeastern corner of uh, the continent of Africa, Red Sea to the west, Mediterranean Sea to the north. And on this map here, I'm just pointing out Israel, Jordan, and UAE or Dubai, simply to show those are pre and post extensions that you can do um, uh, with our Egypt program. All right, Secrets of Egypt in the Nile. This is a 12 day trip in uh, Egypt, of course, three nights in Cairo at the beginning, seven night cruise aboard the Nile, and then uh, one night back in Cairo at the end. Um, with Expedia Cruise, North, cruise Ships North Bay, we've got three dates that we are promoting, October 29th, 2021, February 4th, 2022, and February 25th, 2022. And KK will talk about that later on, uh, closer to the end of our presentation. All right, first thing I'd like to point talk about is Cairo itself. Cairo is a massive city, kind of chaotic, a city of about 22, 23 million people. Cairo is an Arabic word meaning conqueror. And of course you can see the Nile flows through the heart of central Cairo. The Nile itself is uh, the longest river in the world, uh, almost as long or comparable to the Amazon, both are around 4,300 miles long. Uh, the Nile begins up in Uganda and Lake Victoria, starts with the Blue Nile and the White Nile, they converge, and then they, it continues flowing through Sudan and then through Egypt and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt itself, founded in 3100 BC. And uh, just to tell you how big Cairo was at its, you know, even in the 14th century, half a million people were already living in Cairo. A little fun fact about um, Egypt itself. Well, two things, I guess. Number one, weekends are Fridays and Saturdays, opposed to Saturdays and Sundays here. And it was actually the Egyptians that founded, uh, that came up with a 365 day a year calendar. All right, so like I said, we did, I mentioned we have three nights in Cairo, uh, three nights at a beautiful hotel. It's called the Four Seasons Hotel Cairo, 200 rooms across the street from the Botanical Gardens, 
our rooms are partial Nile view. You can see that up there on the left-hand side. And you can see the location of the, uh, uh, the setting of the hotel overlooking the Nile. It's got a beautiful swimming pool inside the uh, uh, in interior of the hotel. And there's a spa, six restaurants featuring all kinds of different cuisine. So you'll be spending three nights at the beautiful Four Seasons Cairo at the first residence in. If you look on TripAdvisor or any of the major hotel sites, you'll find that this is often rated as the number one hotel in the city. Some of the activities that we're going to be doing in Cairo, uh, number one is visit the Egyptian Museum. The Egyptian Museum was built back in uh, 1902 and it is home to the King Tut mask uh, or King Tut exhibit. Uh, King Tut, this mask that you're looking here was founded in 1925. King Tut, he did rule Egypt for 10 years from 1332 BC to 1322 BC. And uh, they founded the mask in 1925. King Tut died at the age of 19. So he started ruling Egypt at the age of nine. How did he die? There's a lot of controversy stories written about it, but most likely he died um, uh, from a chariot race or some sort of chariot race. This is the museum. They are opening a new museum called the Grand Museum. It should be open within the next year. It'll be 10 times the size as the Egyptian Museum. And if it is open, we will be going to the new museum with this additional 30,000 um, uh, historical artifacts that will be added on, including the King Tut uh, exhibit. A lot of these artifacts have never been seen by the public. So it'll be a great place to visit. We'll tour the museum. You have free time on your own. And later on that day, uh, We'll visit the Souk district or Old Cairo. And uh, there's a market there called the Khan Al Kahili Market. And this area has been uh, an area where the uh, craftsmen, artisans have sold their wares since the 10th century. It's a UNESCO Her World Heritage Site now. And we will do a walking tour of the marketplace. And what this area is also famous for are its coffee houses. If you think about it, Starbucks came out, hit the market back in the 1990s, perhaps the 1980s in Seattle, maybe a little, little sooner, but each Cairo has had their own coffee houses since the 1760s. So we will visit a coffee house while we're uh, in the Khan El Khalili market and we'll also have lunch there, a beautiful lunch in a kind of a coffee house slash restaurant. Um, so this is one exciting thing that you'll be able to do um, while we're in Cairo. After this, we'll visit a church and a synagogue, and then we'll head back to the hotel for the night. And uh, this on the third day in Cairo, we will visit the pyramids. The pyramids are made up of limestone and granite. They were the tallest structures in the world up until the 14th century. The tallest uh, pyramid is 488 uh, feet high. At the time when they built these the pyramids, way back in 2500 BC, this whole the pyramids were actually surrounded by a, a workers' village of over 20,000 workers. The uh, uh, pyramids, of course, are the seventh one, one of the seven wonders of the world. There's uh, the uh, number of bricks in a pyramid consists of anywhere from two to two and a half million uh, bricks. A lot of people ask, well, can I get inside the, uh, the tombs? The answer is, uh, these pyramids, the answer is sometimes you can, but more often than not, you cannot. They keep it closed for most of the year. Once in a while, they do open it up, but it is difficult to get in. Uh, if you have any mobility issues, uh, you do have to kind of crawl in, get on your knees, sometimes back up, go down some steep stairs, no hand railings or anything. Remember, these are tombs. So they're normally not open. If they are open the day that we're there, you could go in. Uh, cost is usually around $20, $25 to go in to uh, see the, the tomb in the pyramid, but not to worry because we will visit tombs later on when we're cruising along the Nile. The other option is uh, a camel ride. Um, yes, you can do a camel ride and they cost nowadays um, anywhere from 15 to $20 to do a camel ride. We don't include it. Camels aren't really native to Egypt, but we know they are iconic. So if you do want to do a camel ride, this is actually um, where you would do it. Camel and the owner, they're wandering around the, the pyramids and uh, they'll take you around for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Another great thing that we're going to see near the pyramids are, is the Sphinx. The Sphinx itself, 
built around 2500 BC, almost around the same time as uh, the Great Pyramids. Head is that of a pharaoh, body is that of a lion. The head in this case is that of King Khafre. A couple of unique things about the Sphinx is that it is carved out of one uh, piece of stone. So that's pretty amazing that he did that. And it also took about uh, anywhere from two to three years to build. And actually you can see the pyramids in the background. How long did it take to build the pyramids? Anywhere from 10 to 30 years, depending on um, different literature. It used to think that it was just 10 to 20 years, but in the last maybe eight, nine months, they've said maybe it actually took up to 30 years to build the pyramids. So we'll visit the Sphinx, we'll visit, visit the uh, Great Pyramids. We're also going to head down to a place called the Mena House. The Mena House, um, we'll have a beautiful lunch here. Mena House overlooks the pyramids. And um, it used to be an old hunting lodge built around 1860 and beautiful, stunning architecture, this old hunting lodge. Uh, back in the day, I guess Europeans used to come down and hunt hippos, crocodiles in the Nile Delta. Of course, they don't do that now. But uh, the Mena House itself is, has re retained their, uh, their architecture, but they've added on a hotel at the uh, either end of the, uh, uh, the Mena House. But uh, you still get a great view of the pyramids, five-star lunch. After we've had lunch and, and visited the Mena House, we'll head back into town, visit a church and a synagogue, and uh, then we'll head back to the hotel. On the fourth day, we're going to head back to the Cairo uh, airport and we're going to fly south down to Luxor. The flight down to Luxor takes about an hour. Um, planes are usually 737s, Airbuses and so on. So we'll fly down to Luxor. We'll get to Luxor in the uh, late morning and um, we're going to transfer to our ship, the Amadalia. Here's a picture of our ship, the Amadalia. It has its own private dock in Luxor. The Amadalia is, uh, just give you a little history about it. Uh, it is a brand new ship and just give you an idea. We actually, it's a new ship, but it's not a new ship. And the reason is, is because on the Nile, they're only allowed certain many uh, ships along on the Nile, only a certain amount of licenses. So in order to actually bring a new ship, they don't issue any uh, new licenses. You have to purchase an old ship. And so we bought a ship um, that was like 10 years old and uh, we put it in the shipyard about a year ago and we stripped it down to its core. It's really like a skeleton. Um, and we rebuilt it from the bottom up. And this is the Amadalia. Dahlia is a plant or flower native to uh, Egypt. And uh, it comes with uh, 34 cabins and suites, 16 suites, uh, 18 cabins. And um, well, actually, let's go through and I'll show you some of the uh, features of the Amadelia. This is the upper deck. Uh, this is where we uh, have our swimming pool. We have an outdoor bar. Uh, you can see that on the up top deck, you can see a lot of canopies and um, sun umbrellas. Look at that landscape in the background. Yes, this is a artist rendering, but it really does look like this. Uh, uh, like we need to put a lot of shade on the top deck. And the reason is because the sun almost always seems to shine in uh, along the Nile, particularly between Luxor and Nile, where you'll be, uh, not Luxor and Aswan, where you be cruising. And um, I always tell the story where when I was down in Luxor the last time, because it just looked incredibly dry. And I asked Dina, who was one of our Egyptologists that were going around with me, exploring the area. And I said to Dina, when was the last time it, uh, you saw it rain here in Luxor? And she looked at me stunned, like why would I ask a stupid question like that? And she said 17 to 19 years ago. And that's my God on, uh, honest answer. So you can see it is pretty dry here. Make sure you bring a sun hat, make sure you bring your, uh, your sunblock. You may get a few days of rain in, in Cairo, uh, during the winter months, but down in Luxor and Aswan, um, rain is incredibly rare. All right, uh, this is the atrium or uh, of the uh, Amadalia, and I just wanted to throw that in. You can see that it, it does have a definite, definite Egyptian theme. Lounge, this uh, lounge we have here, uh, we, well, this is a place of congregation. And one of the first things we'll do offer here is every night we'll have what we have in Europe, a sip and sail, which is a complimentary um, uh, happy hour, cocktail reception before dinner. Usually it lasts about an hour and it's usually 
complimentary local beer and local wine, or maybe a cocktail of the day or different cocktails and stuff like that. So we'll continue what we have in Europe, in Egypt, where we have our sip and sail complimentary uh, uh, happy hour. After dinner, we will also have show uh, activity going on in the lounge. And some of the neat things that we'll do here are things like, you know, one night there might be a belly dance show. Another night it could be a uh, what we call a gala galabaya party, which is like a costume party, or something like a Darawa show, which is folklore music and stuff. No matter what, there'll always be fun activity going on after dinner in the main lounge. This is our restaurant, and uh, uh, with our meals, with lunch and dinner, when you're cruising on the Amadaya, we'll always include complimentary local wine and local beer. Local beer tends to be Stella. Local wine is tends uh, to be, well, they do have vineyards in Egypt, not enough to support the local wine trade. So they do import a lot of grapes in from South Africa and they mix it up with the Egyptian grapes. And then you have your local wine, which is actually really good. The food will be uh, continental, you know, what you come, come to used to, what you're used to in North America or in Europe, but we'll also have uh, uh, Middle Eastern or Egyptian fare, uh, which is a lot of influence from the Mediterranean as well as the Middle East. If anyone is uh, gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, and so on like that, uh, no problem, we'll be able to take care of that. And of course, there'll be um, a come from bottled water available. Also have bottled water when we do our walking tours. Um, so let's also talk about our cabins and our suites. So I said there were 16 suites, 18 cabins. This is a suite what you're looking at right now. Uh, either comes with uh, two beds or one bed, just have to let us know in advance. And uh, sitting room up on the right hand side, and this is sort of like an aerial view looking down um, in one of the suites. The suites range in size from 370 to uh, 430 square feet. Standard cabins are anywhere from 196 to 236 square feet. This is a sitting lounge um, aboard the Amadalia. And uh, of course, uh, we'll always have complimentary Wi-Fi um, uh, aboard the Amadalia as well as on-demand TV. Bathrooms in the suites, uh, they all come with a full tub and um, a walk-in shower. And something I didn't realize was important, but it is to a lot of guests, all the suites will come with two double sinks. So that's a look at the uh, Amadaya. So let's talk about the seven night cruise that you're doing on the Nile. Remember how I said we flew into Luxor, got on the ship, settled into your room, have lunch, and then we're gonna head over to the uh, Luxor temple. The Luxor temple is, um, it's, it's, it's over 2,500 years old uh, and uh, built by, Order of King Ramses II. And uh, I wanted to sort of tell you what walking tours of the temples are like in Egypt. Um, the way it works is that, uh, remember if I told you the Ahmadiyya holds 68 guests, 34 rooms, 68 guests. We, are, we split our guests into 20 to 23 guests and you're assigned one Egyptologist. That Egyptologist stays with you from the very beginning in Cairo through the cruise and back to Cairo. We also have an AMA tour director or cruise director that oversees the Egyptologist. So you have several points of contact. When you're walking through the temples along the Nile, the walking tours take anywhere from one hour to two hours. Luxor Temple, about 90 minutes. During the walking tours, you'll also have headphones, so you'll definitely be able to hear. Um, they're, the temples are the way they were back in 2500 BC. So there's no handrails. Um, you know, there's no ramps, walkways are pretty rough. And so if you do have any mobility issues, um, you'll have to make sure that you can either, you know, stand, walk and stand for up to two hours. Um, and if you're in a wheelchair, um, the, the, most of these temples aren't equipped for wheelchairs. And um, so some are, some aren't. But if you let us know in advance, we'll be able to tell you which wheelchair, which temples you would be able to visit. Some you'll have to, won't be able to visit and travel with an open mind. And, um, um, 
can be on the ship and looking at the, the view. I should also note that the Almadaya does have an elevator uh, from the bottom deck up to the, um, the uh, deck right below the sun deck. So this is the uh, Luxor Temple. This will be your first walking tour. Another temple we're gonna visit is uh, Queen Hatshepsut. And Queen, as Magdi says in Cairo, if you can't pronounce it, just say Queen Hot Chicken Soup. And that's kind of what I say. Uh, Queen Hot Chicken Soup, she reigned Egypt for 20 years. She was an incredibly strong leader. Um, broad, if you see statues of her today, she's got, she'll have broad shoulders, sometimes a beard, king's crown. You know, if you think about 4,000 years ago, they had women leaders in Egypt, you know, leading in this nation. And if we get a female leader today, whether it's a president, prime minister, governor, whatever, it just kind of makes the news. But 4,000 years ago, didn't make the news. It was the norm. She's a fearless leader. And that's why she does have a beard and stuff that a lot of the structure, because she was, they consider her so strong, like a man. And that's why you see statues of her today with, um, a beard and broad shoulder. Another great uh, thing we're going to do here, and this is kind of exclusive, is visit the queen, the tomb of Queen Nefertari. Who was Queen Nefertari? First wife of King Ramses II. Um, she was considered the most beautiful. Um, she could read, she could write, she was very well educated, and uh, she died at the age of about 45. And uh, King Ramses, he probably lived anywhere between, well, it's a big range, 66 to 92 years. So in either case, living to 45 years old back uh, in those days, it's like living to 100 years old today. And living to 66 or 90 years old would be like living to 130. So Queen Nefertari was King Ramses. It was his first love and his real love. And he built this incredible tomb for her. And Queen Nefertari's tomb, um, they really didn't explore it or anything until the 1980s. And uh, then they kind of slowly but surely started to open it up uh, to the public. But still, not many people get to see the tomb. And the reason for that is because the Queen Nefertari tomb, just to get in, per person is like $125. It's included with AMA. Other cruise companies don't really include it because of the price. And this is why very few people get to see it. And if you go into the Queen Nefertari tomb, um, you'll watch for little poems and poetry that King Ramses wrote to Queen Nefertari. So this is really a cool exclusive access that um, very few people get to see. Um, and that you'll certainly take the memories of the tomb back home with you. The Temple of Horus, uh, it's, not, it's not as uh, old as the Karnak Temple, built around 230 BC. And I put this in here simply because uh, it was founded back back around 1860 by a French um, archaeologist who was digging around in the area. And I came across something rock hard. He didn't know what it was. He kept trying to dig around. Couldn't figure out what this rock was. And the reason was is because this uh, temple was covered completely by a sand dune. So that just tells you how the desert took over with these uh, uh, these ruins. But he kept digging and digging and he found the Temple of Horus. And uh, I guess the story I wanted to tell you was, look at the size of this thing. And it was covered completely by a sand dune up until the 1860s. Uh, okay, the uh, another picture of the Nile. Um, we're looking south here. And I wanted to point a few things out here that in Egypt, uh, well, first of all, here in the US, we say sunrise and sunset. Egyptians never said that. They actually said, the birth of the day was sunrise, the death of the day was sun, uh, sunset. What you'll find in Egypt, the temples are on the east side of the river, the tombs are on the west side of the river. Tombs, this is represent death, the sun sets, the death of the day, and that's why the tombs are all on the west side of the Nile. Temple, uh, it's the uh, birth of the day, and we have the temples. So for the most part, you'll find tombs on the west side of the Nile. Also along the way, we will take a ride in a felucca boat and uh, feluccas are uh, the way the locals get around uh, the Nile. We'll also visit um, a Nubian village. This is the village of Hesa, an island on an island in the Nile, on the Nile. Uh, who are the Nubians? Well, they feel they settled here in uh, Egypt back around 5,000 BC. And uh, actually, no, about 8,500 BC. Where did they come from? the central Sahara. So they settled along the Nile and on the islands and the Nile and stuff like that. 
and you see these homes that they live in, incredible color, colorful, lots of drawings, lots of craftsmanship. You see, you see all different types of things, paintings and so on. But this every little figurine on here on the home means something. And actually each home on the outside tells the history of the family. Pretty fascinating. Uh, uh, how they've done this. And if you want to think about it in comparison, the Nubians were the first, you know, people to arrive in Egypt. And you can compare that to sort of like the Native Americans or First Nations in Canada, or the Inuit up north, you know, they were the, uh, the first ones here before um, settlers came in. And in this case, they came over from uh, Rome and Greece and uh, to settle in, those were the original Egyptians. Typical uh, Nubian. All right, and while we're in the village, we will take a walking tour of the village. We'll meet the Nubians and a lot of different cruise companies do that. And that's great, but usually then you head back to the whole, uh, back to the ship after that. With us, uh, we will visit the Nubian village. We'll tour it with the locals, visit the spice, mark, spice market, but we'll also take it one step further. And we're actually gonna stay on the island, stay with the villagers and have lunch with them. So it's again, the people to people contact that we have. And these are a lot of the memories that um, we all come home with. Uh, it's all about the people that we meet along the way. Abu Simbo, um, an, another great temple. And this was built by King Ramses and it was built along the Nile about 200 miles south of Aswan. Aswan is the southernmost point we go on the Nile River. So to see Abu Simbo, you actually have to fly. So I just want to give you a little bit of the history behind uh, Abu Simbel. It was built along the Nile. King Ramses had built it for uh, Queen Nefertari and it was pretty much in use for about a thousand years. And then it was abandoned. And it kind of just sat along the Nile um, for thousands of years. And then in the late 50s, 1960s, they started to build the Aswan Dam or the High Dam in um, just south of Aswan on the Nile. And the lake that was going to form behind the dam, Lake Nassor, was going to cover Abu Simbel. So what the Egyptian government did is they took it apart, brick by brick by brick, and moved it up the hill 600 feet and rebuilt it again. Um, the first time I ever saw Abu Simbel, I, I had no idea what I was going to see. And seeing Abu Simbel uh, for the first time is like seeing you know, the, the pyramids for the first time, uh, Great Wall for the first time, Machu Picchu for the first time. It is something that kind of stays with you. Um, a really neat thing also about Abu Simbel is on February 22nd and October 22nd of each year, when the sun is birth or the birth of the day or when the sun rises uh, in the east, the first two rays that come over the horizon will shine directly through that door and out the other end. And the reason I bring this up, this is, we offer this as an optional trip but not everyone gets to go see uh, um, Abu Simbel because the number of seats to go see Abu Simbel is limited to the number of seats that are available on the plane that day. Um, and so ships, cruise companies, they do sell Abu Simbel as an optional cruising down the Nile, um, it, but it's first come first serve. But like I said, depending on the number of seats, the plane will hold that day. And the planes are like 737th. You board your flight in Aswan, it takes about 40 minutes to fly down to um, Abu Simbel. So uh, what we've done, we're working with the airline now and uh, we've blocked a bunch of seats. So those of you that do want to go to Abu Simbel, you can pre-book it at the time of booking. Um, the cost uh, varies anywhere from 325 to $345. <clears throat> you can pre-book it so you're assured that you will get to see Abu Simbel on the trip. We reckon, we figure maybe 80% of your guests would like to go see Abu Simbel. 20% would rather stay on board and have a relaxing free evening. So remember, you know, do some research on Abu Simbel and stuff. Uh, this is a great place. And this is something you may want to pre-book before you head over uh, to Egypt. This is uh, the inside of Abu Simbel. All right, another really uh, interesting temple that we're going to visit is Komombo. And Komombo is a, about 30 miles north of Aswan. And it was built around 330 BC. And it's dedicated to Sobek, who was the crocodile god, and uh, Horus, who was the falcon head god. Uh, what makes this place really interesting is, well, at one time there were a lot of crocodiles in the Nile. Um, if you remember what I said, this is dedicated to Sobek, the crocodile god. You'll find a lot of mummified crocodiles in this area. 
Karnak Temple. This is the one temple that will probably take about two hours to do a walking tour. It is the largest temple. Give you an idea how large it is. Um, you can see the columns, absolutely spectacular. Um, and uh, Karnak Temple covers about 250 acres. And uh, they say it's uh, probably around 2,500 years old. So Karnak Temple, another great temple to visit, probably one of the most famous of all the temples. And uh, finally, another temple, I'm not only pointing out some of the temples, but I'm not pointing all everything along the way. The Temple of Hathor, they consider this the best preserved temple built again around 2,500 years ago. And what makes this interesting is that these temp the temple here, they have a, a bunch of pools or sacred pools surrounding the temples and they're filled with stone now. You can kind of see the gravel in one of the sacred pools there. But the Egyptians were swimming in pools, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago. You know, and we look at this as kind of like a, a luxury to even today uh, to have our own private pool or something, but the Egyptians or even a public pool, the Egyptians were swimming in their pools long, long time ago. They, so many things that the Egyptians did, we're still doing today. They started a lot of different things. So we're on the Nile for seven nights, and then we're going to fly back to Cairo for one last night. And when we fly back to Cairo, um, get there in a right around noon, we're going to head over to uh, the presidential palace. And why are we going to go to the presidential palace? Um, if you think about it, say you're in Europe or anywhere, somewhere in Asia or something, you know, after the first week or so, you visit a lot of churches, plazas, alley, you know, brick alleyway shops and stuff. Fantastic, right? And then uh, maybe by seventh or eighth day, wouldn't it be nice to see something a little different than, uh, you know, sightseeing and stuff. And that's what we're doing here in Egypt. We've seen a lot of temples and tombs and stuff. Let's do something different. So we will visit the presidential palace in Cairo. Presidential palace, and now they also call it the Abdeen Palace, built around 1873. President still lives here. Deacon carries come from around the world. This is where they stay. The palace has a bunch of little smaller museums, like a clock museum, a historic clock museum. There's even a museum of, uh, of gifts that dignitaries have brought. It's an art museum, a textile museum. And we're gonna take this. It's really an exclusive place to visit. Not many people get to go in. It's expensive to get in, but we cover it. Um, we get a tour of the palace and then We'll take it one step further and we'll have a, a, a farewell lunch at the presidential palace. And um, why are we doing a farewell lunch? Simply uh, because flights back to uh, North America leave early the next morning, most for the most part. So we thought, let's have a celebration during the day. So on the last night, uh, you can you know, relax, unwind, uh, get ready for your uh, flight back to North America and we'll take you back to the airport um, the next day. This is kind of what it looks inside the, uh, uh, the, the palace. And after we visit the palace, we'll take another drive through Old Cairo and visit a church. And uh, then we'll head back to the Four Seasons for your final night before you're taken back to the airport uh, on the last day. Now, that's our 12 day tour of uh, uh, Egypt and Cairo, there are some extensions that you can do before and after. And the first one I'm going to point out is Jordan, which is a four nights pre-extension. And in Jordan, it consists of two nights in Amman and two nights in Petra. Amman is the uh, cultural capital of Jordan. It's a very old city. In fact, you'll find statues here well over 7,000 years old. Um, population of about 4 million. So you'll fly into um, Amman, get your visa. We actually supply you your visa. We'll get that for you on your behalf and you'll receive that on arrival. And we'll transfer you to the hotel. Um, and the hotel we're using in Amman is the St. Regis. It's currently under renovation. Beautiful five-star hotel. And while we're in Amman, in Amman, we will do a city tour of the old historic section of Amman. And uh, we'll visit the uh, ancient city of Jerash, probably built around the uh, second century. Um, kind of got the great Greek Roman architecture. The Romans uh, were in this area. You can kind of see the Roman Colosseum. Uh, while we're out in Jerash, we'll also stop at it's kind of a castle restaurant, place and have a great lunch there. And uh, before we head back to Amman. So it's two nights in Amman. And then we'll head four hours south from Oman to Petra. We'll stop at Mount Nebo along the way. Um, Petra, 
an incre incredible civilization. This scene that you're looking at now, this is the treasury. Um, I guess it was made famous in the movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. They had a ball kind of rolling, rolling down. And um, anyways, Petra probably settled around 5,000 BC and the civilization thrived for thousands of years. And one reason it did thrive is because a lot of mountains surround Petra um, and uh, the locals, they built these massive conduits or like uh, canals to bring the water down from the mountains into the city. And, uh, and that's how they thrived for so many, you know, centuries. And then around the second century, uh, the, there's a couple of earthquakes, trading routes changed, and uh, there was a drought. And the civilization was probably abandoned around the fourth century. What makes it even more incredible is that it wasn't even discovered again until about 1830 uh, by a Swiss explorer. Uh, today, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we're going to spend a day at Petra, two nights down there, one day to see, explore the treasury and all its, uh, all its glory of Petra. The hotel we're going to stay at is the uh, Old Village Resort, Petra. Uh, a great property. And I point this out is because it's kind of, it's a four-star hotel. You've been staying in five-star properties, the Amadaya five-star ship. Uh, but here at Petra, we chose this hotel. Yeah, there's a couple of five-star hotels in Petra, a Moven Pick and a Marriott, but we chose this one because this hotel is kind of unique in architecture. It's kind of built in, into the side of the mountain. Number two, it's owned by the locals. And uh, we thought this was a great way for the AMA guests as well as uh, AMA uh, to support the locals. Um, it's a solid four-star hotel. It's so local in that uh, they don't even have a liquor license because alcohol is kind of tabooed in the Middle East. But if you want to pick up some beer or wine or something, you can get it in Amman and we can bring it all down for you. And uh, if you go to TripAdvisor, you'll find the Old Village Resort as the number one rated hotel in uh, Petra. So that's our four nights in Jordan. It is the most popular of all the extensions that we have. Another option is Dubai, three nights. And again, this is before you go to Cairo and Dubai, an, a massive city. It's on the Persian Gulf, built out of nothing. And uh, the architecture is stunning, amazing, cheesy, whatever you want to call it. They've got it there at Dubai. But it's something that I think once you've seen it, you really do appreciate it. And the hotel that we're going to use in Dubai is the... Uh, the JW Marriott Marquis, five-star hotel. And just look at the architecture there. You can see that it is kind of um, um, unique. Rooms are great. And when you're in Dubai, we're there for three nights. We'll offer, uh, include, a, of course, transfers, city tour, explore the waterfront area. And I always tell the story where, and remember how I said, well, when I was last in Dubai, it was in July, it was 117 degrees. and it, me and our, our local AMA guide there, we were exploring Dubai, looking for really neat things to, for our guests to visit. And uh, it was like noon. I said, I can't take the heat anymore. Middle of July, we don't normally go to Dubai in J July on our program. And he said, let's go to the mall. We got this new mall here. And I go, I don't go to malls. He goes, let's go to this mall. It's different. Let's just get a bite to eat. So we went into the mall. And as I walked in, there was a massive, indoor ski mountain inside this mall. And being a skier, I just thought I was just out of this world. And uh, so for the next three and a half hours, we spent skiing inside a mall in Dubai in July when it was 117 degrees outside. So that's kind of what Dubai is all about. But we'll do a city tour, visit the old part of the city, and then we'll also head out into the desert. You'll do a sand dune tour in a Jeep. We'll have dinner out in the desert. And um, really unique setting uh, out, in the, out in the sand dunes. And then on another day, we'll head down to Abu Dhabi in the UAE. And uh, Abu Dhabi is about 80 kilometers southwest of um, um, Dubai. And we'll tour the city and we'll also visit the Zayi Grand Mosque, incredible mosque. Just look at the it's just a stunning site. And uh, it's not old, it's built, I think, around 1983, 1984. Um, and when we're in Abu Dhabi, we're in there on a Thursday. But if we were in Abu Dhabi on a Friday, you would be welcomed, well, 
and you were in the uh, this mosque, you'd be along with 40,000 other worshipers. So it is a massive mosque. So that's our three nights in Dubai. Again, you can do that uh, before Egypt, or you can do Jordan before your visit to Egypt. After Egypt, you have an option of visiting Israel for four nights. And we would fly to uh, Tel Aviv uh, from Cairo. The flight takes about an hour. It's a nonstop flight. And we'll fly to Tel Aviv. We'll tour Tel Aviv, the old section of Tel Aviv. And then we'll head up to, to uh, Jerusalem for four nights. And um, in Jerusalem, we sort of just touch on everything. And that's the whole idea is to give the guests sort of feel of what everything Israel has to offer. If you're Christian and your Christian heritage is really important to you, you'll probably go to um, Israel for a week, 10 days, maybe even two weeks. If you're Jewish and you're, you know, you're exploring your Jewish heritage or anything like that, you'll probably want to go to Cairo for a week, 10 days, two weeks, same thing. But what we're trying to do is give you a touch of everything that it has to offer. So basically, when we're in Jerusalem, we'll, we'll visit Bethlehem, we'll visit Jesus' tomb, tomb of King David. Um, we'll even visit the Jewish quarter, visit the old market where... Uh, you know, the locals go to shop for their uh, fresh produce, vegetables, fruit, and so on like that. Um, hotel we'll stay at is the Waldorf Astoria. And uh, it's a five-star hotel with the room. And then another thing that we'll also do is take a day trip outside of Jerusalem and we'll visit Masada. And Masada is a Hebrew word meaning strong foundation or fortress. And you can see that here. Um, it was built around 30 BC by King Herod and um, it was the final site of the first Jewish Roman war. And this was the place where the uh, elite used to go to, to escape from the city, I guess. And, uh, but uh, it's a world heritage site now. And to go to Masada, the only way to get up there is by a cable car. And you can kind of see that on the left-hand side, the black thing kind of sticking out. So we'll head outside of Jerusalem. We'll go to Masada, we'll tour, do a walking, to a trip along the top of Masada. And then look over to the left-hand side there, you can see a lot of water. And uh, that water is actually the Dead Sea. And after we visit Masada, we will head down uh, to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest elevation in the world. Um, it ranges in from you know, 1,600 to 1,400 feet below sea level, depending on the level of the Dead Sea. And once we're down at the Dead Sea, We'll visit a resort and anyone that wants to has the opportunity to get for a swim in the Dead Sea. And why would you want to do that? Uh, mainly because it's the Dead Sea is so famous for salt content. And salt content is so high that it's virtually impossible to sink. So even a non-swimmer could go into the Dead Sea, but we'll put a life jacket on anyways. So those that want to get in the Dead Sea, no problem. Those that don't want to, we, we're visiting a resort lunch is included, you can have a leisurely lunch. And we all know like down on the Dead Sea, you go to spas now, nowadays you'll see Dead Sea mud or Dead Sea salt, you know, for your face, body wraps, stuff like that. Maybe you'll want to visit one of the spas at the resort. But, um, so this is the four nights in Israel. So we touch a little bit of everything there. And uh, on the last day in Jerusalem, we'll transfer you back to Tel Aviv and then you'll be able to fly back um, to the US. So um, that's my presentation. And I was gonna pass it back on to uh, KK if she has anything she would like to say. Absolutely, yes, thank you so much. I'll invite you to pass it on back and I'll share my screen at this end. There we go. So thank you again so much, Todd. That was fantastic. It was um, just as wonderful to hear all of the history and to see the size of these tombs and temples that we're going to see, they're just fascinating. I know from my own experience, I was just in awe standing next to the enormity of these wonderful uh, places and realizing um, that they were built without any of the modern technology that we have today. It really is awesome. It's one of those things that uh, when you visit a destination like this, it stays with you. It's, it's really an incredible experience. 
Um, before we jump into the questions, uh, I do see that there are some questions uh, coming in through the chat box, and I would like to encourage you, um, if you'd like to uh, write any more questions into the chat box, uh, we'll go ahead and address some of those. And if we don't get to all the questions, uh, we'll make sure to, to reach out to you directly and make sure that you get answers to all your questions. Um, I want to first remind you all that we do have uh, an additional uh, gift for you for attending our virtual event today. If you are um, making a reservation for one of our three dates, as a reminder, those three dates that we have are October 29th of 2021. And then we have February 4th of 22 and February 25th of 22. And if you can imagine that we added this um, very special date of February 25th, uh, we just added it this afternoon because the February 4th date is selling out so fast that we only have a few rooms left. Um, these, this is a very small ship. And as a result, um, and I should really say, combined with the fact that Egypt is so hot, and I'm not talking about temperature, I'm talking about popularity. It is so on fire at the moment, everyone wants to see it, and who wouldn't? It's, it's been a little bit off limits for a while, and now things are so much better. So again, you will receive um, an additional $100 per stateroom onboard credit when you book within the next seven days. We are available, of course, um, by phone, by video appointment. Uh, as those of you who have already worked with us, uh, thank you for those lovely kind words as we were getting together earlier. Um, we are not a call center. We are a, an independent uh, part of the Expedia group here in Petaluma, California. And our consultants are well-trained and highly versed in all wonderful destinations. And so if you want to video chat with one of them and get to know them, we encourage you to do that. You can also give us a call on the toll-free number and of course, email us um, with any uh, information that you're looking for. And as I get to these questions, I'm going to just slip onto this next slide here. Um, this just reminds us of who we are as a center. And uh, we are very, very proud of not only the accolades that we have achieved, but we are most proud of our guests who keep coming back to us again and again. And so we want to thank you for that. Thank you for several of you who are on today who have been with us several times, both of our, on our wine programs as well as our other wonderful adventures. There are many of them. So I want to address some questions that uh, have come across and Todd, perhaps you can help answer them. Uh, I've also left up here on the screen uh, some upcoming virtual events that we have for other destinations, but I'm going to go ahead and, um, and just in case you want to take note of that, or if you have questions about it, please feel free to reach out to us and we can get you all of those dates. You're going to see that there's a combination of the wine cruise programs that we have, as well as some of our destinational focus. Also, as the chats are coming in with the questions, um, I wanna mention this wonderful Netflix documentary uh, that Todd shared with me. And I thought it would be just perfect for us to quickly mention here, if you are interested in Egyptian history, this is a must see. Um, when Todd sent it to me, I thought, oh, I don't know, what, what's it gonna be about? The first few minutes were maybe a little slow to get into, but boy, there's an ending. So make sure that you watch it all the way through. And Todd, I'm sure that you will agree. It was really interesting. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, very fascinating. And I should just quickly tell you that um, this documentary, they're talking about things that they're doing last year and even at the beginning of this year. So this is, this is really relevant, very current uh, and really, really fascinating. I, I just loved it. So uh, to get to these questions, let's see. Uh, the first one I have is uh, Todd and uh, let's see, are visas required for Egypt? Okay, so the way it works in Egypt is, yes, you do need a visa and um, the visa is $25 and you purchase the visa online before you leave about three to four weeks prior to your departure. It's really simple and easy form, fill out your credit card and they'll send you a confirmation. You can get a visa on arrival, but that'll slow you down through immigration. We, um, it's just a much simpler process if you do it ahead of time, 25 US dollars. All right, that's really easy, I like that. And um, also to note too, just folks, um, your passport, your US passport does have to be valid for six months after your return of the trip in order to get that visa. So make sure that there's a good validity on your passport. Uh, the another question here is what is the best time to go? Well, actually, um, actually, when you're going, it's the best time to go. So, you know, uh, 
second half of October through December and then February through March, to me are the most comfortable times of the year to go. And the temperatures will be like uh, 70s and 80s during the day and then 50, 60 degrees at night. Maybe a cooler, a little cooler at night um, uh, uh, in February, but perfect. Excellent, thank you. And then there's another question. Um, how much touring is there each day? And she asks, um, do you come back to the ship for lunch or will they be expected to have lunch outside the ship? Now, for the most part, you'll come back for the ship uh, for lunch. There's a lot of cruising on the Nile and every day there's at least one temple tour. Sometimes there's two. Um, and again, the other days we might just visit a village. You'll get be able to get off and go off and do your own thing. But the days are really leisurely and they're not hectic. Oh, that's great. And another question, um, is the ship fully air conditioned? The ship is 100% air conditioned. You do need air conditioning in Egypt. No one in their right mind would go to, wouldn't go to Egypt without your air conditioning. Absolutely. Yeah. No, those are great questions. Um, let me see, I don't think I see. Oh, someone's asking if I would just repeat the dates again. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. Um, so the departures are October 29th of 2021. Um, and then the two dates in February, February 4th only has the uh, window type staterooms still available. If you want the veranda and the suites, uh, those are available on the 25th, the February 25th date that we added this afternoon. And again, um, you're welcome to call the consultant who reached out to you. Uh, you're welcome to call our telephone number, the 800 number that you see there. And we'd be happy to, um, to address any questions that you have and help you with reservations. Uh, I was delighted and surprised at how many reservations were already made first thing uh, this morning. We'd barely gotten off of the um, event when reservations were being made. So uh, very exciting. And uh, let's see, do you have any other questions coming in on the chat that I can't see, James? Um, no, I think we're... I think we're good. Um, so if you don't have any other questions, or again, I know that some of them may have a little delay coming through, um, I want you to just encourage you, please, to go ahead and send them through, and we'll make sure to get back to you with all the answers that you have. We certainly hope that you have had a wonderful tour down the Nile and an adventure to Egypt, and even more so, we hope that you enjoy um, the trip that you have with us in Ama Waterways coming up here in the not too distant future. But most of all, thank you, Todd, uh, for the adventure today. Thank you for sure. your wonderful stories and expertise. We appreciate that and appreciate your time. So thank you everybody for coming. We hope you have a great, great evening. We look forward to taking you on your next adventure. Thanks for coming. Take care.